Tuesday, July 20th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the Chicago Express rolls through the ages. Let's do this. Today, I have eliminated the Ode Hobo that was permeating the, the front bathroom of our apartment. Not, not, not so much Are you the, sure? Not so much the I don't know. Hobo. Are you, I don't think you did. Not the Ode Hobo, but I think from now on, my, the, there's a word for the, for the smell of a hobo, and I think it is hobo. Uh, well, you have not eliminated it because it is uh, all over. Yes, all over in the sealed studio room with the air conditioning on, cut off both uh, circulatorily and physically from the other room. Well, it's not cut off from you, which was in this room, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. emanates from you. Yeah, you see, your implication is that the hobo, <laughs> which the hobo is was emanating. From <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Up until I moved to New York, right? The word hobo meant what it's supposed to mean. Hobo was a Tran, you know, there's like the transient who works versus the transient who doesn't versus well, the stationary person. Yes, who works. they're are bums, hobos, vagrants, tramps, drifters. Like tramps wander they're around. They're all different. They mean very specific things. If you're but, just sitting around drunk, not doing shit, that's a bum. But if you're like traveling around, actually doing stuff, sometimes tramp. Hobo, maybe. Or yeah. tramp. It depends. I think tramps travel and don't work. Hobos travel like, and do work. If you're a homeless guy running a pirate radio station in the woods, that's a hobo. Now, I think it's the tramps are the ones who travel around and work, and hobos travel around and don't work. Mm, I don't know. Regardless, now that I live in the city, it seems like everyone just says hobo to refer to specifically someone with the hobo, <laughs> probably on the subway. <laughs> that's <laughs> In that right. empty car. So, okay, is that all you got? That's all I got. Oh, so check I, I eliminated out. the hobo. I'm riding my bike over the bridge just now. Yeah. Like 10 minutes ago. Or maybe even 15. And I'm going up, up towards Queens. And there's a guy coming down, down towards Manhattan. Downtown. And down, he's, down, 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 right? Down. So he's, he's, he's a kind of large guy, but he's riding a bike all good. Right? He's got no problems. All right. And he's got this grimace on his face. And it looks just like E Honda. Like, oh my God, it's E Honda riding a bike. <laughs> and then he brings his head down to sort of get low to get speed going in the downhill. And it was a Honda headbutt. It was it was just epic. It was this epic Honda headbutt coming down the hill. Wow. That's it. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like, whoa, E Honda, oh shit. He's coming down the bike again. <laughs> <laughs> I have very little trouble with E Honda, to be honest. He's probably, I can just kind of poke him out of the way. No, 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 no. You got to watch out. There's some guys, they're good with E Honda. They'll just sit on you, and then as soon as you get up, they'll sit on you again. Oh, you'll get up, and they'll sit on you. And they'll sit on you again. You were staying back. They just sit on you over and over again, and you can't do anything about it unless you're good. So, probably the most important gaming anything we could talk about. We NS2. The how, many, how many shows are we going to do on NS2, you think? How total? many strips did Penny Arcade do on Tribes? All right, we'll count and or we'll do the same number. Or even just Tribes 2. We can get away with that many. All right, so we'll count and that's the number we will do. But regardless, the alpha of NS2 is coming out in six so days. So we're going to do an episode on the alpha. Of course and we're going to do an episode on the alpha. And the final release. And maybe talk more about exploits of, of uh, playing the actual release. So and then I, maybe a show when the final release sucks we don't play it anymore. It's very sad that we're not going to Otakon. But I realized it's probably for the best. Because that is the first weekend after the NS2 Alpha is in my hands. Oh, shit. What else am I going to be doing that weekend? What else am I going to be doing that week? I should just take work off. <laughs> take a week off. But, but the thing is, we almost made that mistake with Team Fortress. Oh, my God. If I, had taken, if I had taken the day off for Team Fortress, I might have just gone into work for a half day. Yeah, so... Uh... The, I'm not making that mistake. It's a vi you know, it's great, but it's a video game. It's not going anywhere. Well, it, tribes who went somewhere every second in the shitter. Counted. What do you mean every second counted? Every second of playing tribes counted. Oh, tribes! You said I think it's Team Fortress. Oh, every second of Team Fortress counted just for something very different. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, don't you got some news? Nothing to talk oh, about? Oh, and news. Oh, well, there's that. Uh, I guess my news is the Alien Swarm game that's coming out, which I keep getting. Oh, I guess it's out. It's, it's not coming out. It is out. And I keep getting confused because this old Genesis game called Alien Storm. 
And there's another game on the Xbox and PC called Alien Breed, right? So it's, it's confusing. But um, what this game is, it's a four-player co-op shmup. Uh, not shmup, uh, Robotron shooter, right? And I've been looking for a game like that for a long time. I actually remember we were at Gaming for Hope a long time ago, and some guys were playing a game that looked just like that. It looked like a ro- an a- a, you know, a Marines versus Aliens co-op Robotron shooter. Yeah, on the what PC. was that game? I can't for the life of me find what game that was, no matter how hard I try. Because I didn't even, I was trying to look at the guy's monitor because I was thinking about buying it. I barely even looked at the game. I was like, oh, that looks cool. I couldn't even figure out what game it was. And if anyone knows of a game that is just like Alien Swarm, but not, and is perhaps older, a few years older for the PC, let me know because I want it. But uh, Alien Swarm is a, it's, it's on the Source engine and it's a free, absolutely free co-op Robotron shooter. And I haven't played it yet because when I tried to download it last night, Steam servers are all busy. Okay, Steam, look. This has happened like a bunch of times. Every time a new popular game comes out, the servers are busy. You got to have enough servers, all right? This is the reason Steam originally came out was because when we tried to get an update to Counter-Strike, we couldn't. I so, remember those days. I'd come home from school, and you're sitting there. Like, you know, I'd come home from class. You're not playing Counter-Strike. I'm like, Scott, why aren't you playing Counter-Strike? You'd be I've like, i got to get the new update. I can't play without it. And then, fuck, now I got to get the update. Yep. I don't miss those days at all. I think what they could do... So they Steam could fake solved it. the problem, but now they unsolved the problem because... Uh, Steam could fake it. All they would have to do is stagger the releases a little bit. So say a game's going to come out. Don't say a, a time. Just say a day. And pick regions. And for each region, be like, eh, let people start downloading here now. They don't, eh, even, they don't even have to do that. Now. All they have to do is, right, I click on download, right? Which means I want to download this game. And what does it say? It says, sorry, the servers are busy. Why do you tell me that? I mean, let's say they don't. Well, yeah, why let's not say, just have it downloaded whenever it can later? Duh, keep checking on its own like duh, the Xbox does. Duh, ah. duh. It's a no-brainer, guys. So, 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 so. I mean. Scott, Scott, a question. <laughs> Will they make more, less, or the same amount of money if they implement this? You've uh, already they're gonna, bought okay. the game. They're going to make no different money uh, because this game is free. Well, then. <laughs> But this game is trying to convince people. The thing about this game is it is free, but it actually comes with a lot of updates to the Source engine, uh, including the ability to make a non-first-person game on the Source engine, uh, among other things, right? So there's actually trying to really encourage people to mod the hell up and to make new games on the Source engine in this kind of variety, and that's why they've made this free game here. So it's, you know, I've heard a lot of complaints about the game, and I mean, how much can you really complain? It's free about shitty controls and such and such. And they're probably true. I don't know. I haven't played it. But uh, hopefully there'll be some awesome mods and shit for awesomeness. And uh, I look forward to the possibilities. Uh, so also uh, yesterday, you know, the reason we're doing kind of a messed up schedule is Scott noticed it on Kotaku and we went to a lecture or a, a panel really about what games are going to be like in the year 2040. Yeah, I think we paid 10 bucks to go to a panel. One panel. One panel. That's why things like Oticon and, actually- and PAX are such a deal. I mean, PAX, I, well, I don't pay, but you pay, what, 60 bucks and you get three days worth of this stuff? Yeah. I mean, you know, the panel was, it was okay, but it felt a little short. Well, I think the problem was that they had really good panelists like Eric Zimmerman and Ben Fetter and these other people, and they didn't well- stay on topic for shit. No. They talked about the future of gaming for like five minutes. Yeah, so the deal was that it was actually two groups coming together for this, right? So you had um, this thing called the Y plus 30. And what Y plus 30 does is they get together and they have panels. And the panels are always about what is X going to be like in 30 years. So it'll always be like, what is going to, what is car? What will what your is, mom be like in 30 years? What is transportation going to be like in 30 years? What are telecommunications going to be like in 30 years? What are, uh, you know, what are paintings going to be like in 30 years? What are, you know, anything, uh, clothing, fashion, any anything that you can think of, what will it be like in 30 years? It's a cool idea. They, they kind of make a point that most kind of economic models and economic forecasts that businesses use forecast out at most five years. Yeah. They don't even look beyond that. No, because there's no way to know. So, uh, and the, the other group was the New York City Gaming Meetup, you know, meetup.com, New York City Gaming Meetup, I guess. And they combined to do Future of Gaming 30 years out. And the three people on the panel were Steven Totillo, who used to be from MTV, but now he's from Kotaku. Uh, Zerman, who is the head of Game Lab. And uh, the C- he knew what was up. I, I liked his answers. Yeah, he's I wanted one to talk of those, to him more. One of those, like, he's one of those like, big personality guys. Uh, and then there's um, the CEO of Take-Two Interactive. 
which is a, a awesome game publisher. They publish Civilization. Ha ha. Huh. Yeah, they're kind of important. All right, and uh, you know, they, the, there was also the uh, the moderator guy. What was his name? I forget. Sorry. I don't remember. I got all my sorry, notes. moderator guy. But it, it was a good panel. It was fun. The only thing, it, aside from them not staying on topic. I don't think anyone knows how to take questions from the audience because they open it up to questions and it's the fanboy, how do I get into the industry question, which is really, please notice me and get me into the industry. What does that have to do with what gaming is going to be like in 30 years? Nothing. And the guy tried to later frame it. He's like, yeah, so what should I be doing? You know, keeping in mind the industry 30 years from now. Yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah. And the other guy's question was basically me, me, blah, 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 me, 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 point, 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 talk, 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 no question. No question came out of that guy. Yeah. my I have a new idea, right? Whenever we take questions, which we don't do that often. At best, we'll lie and say we're going to take questions, and then we, oh, we're out of time, yeah. and then we kick everyone out of the room. That's right. What we're going to do is we're going to have Scott's rules of question asking, and if someone fa- breaks a rule of Scott's rule of question asking, I'm just going to point the finger and make them walk away, and they're done. I think this will work. Just, I'm just going to wave them off, be like, eh. Because we've won the Woo game now, bit by bit. Every time we do panels at, like, anime cons... We, we do our little, like, two-minute shtick, and it stops the Wu game. So Mostly. clearly, we can do a little meta shtick to stop whatever BS we don't so want to deal with. So before we take any questions, I'm going to put up on the screen Scott's rules of asking questions. And the rules are as follows. Number one, your question will be on topic. Number two, your question will be, well, number one, your question will be a question. I think the easy way around that, you get one sentence, it must end in a question mark. Yes, uh, Semicolons are okay, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the idea is that you will ask a question. You will not have a whole bunch of sentences around the question. Your question will be on topic. You know, your question will not be specific to you. It will be, you know, it was about the topic in general. It cannot be anything about you, right? Not allowed. And I guess I might come up with a couple other rules to throw in there. Um, but yeah, that's we're going to have those kind of rules. And if you break any of those rules, we're just not going to address you. Just sit down. You broke the rules. Of course, rather than even doing that, we can just have the moderator who has the microphone goes up to people and she's like, you know, you're a fan. Yes, but the moderator will use Scott's rules of question asking oh, yeah, yeah. to judge uh, whether or not the question will be permitted or not. The key is we got to point out what we're doing. And then when the Q&A is awesome, as opposed to the usual Q&A that sucks at everything, maybe other people start doing the same thing. The thing is, I don't want to intimidate people away from attempting to ask the question because... Uh, someone actually has a legitimately good question. They got to ask that shit. Yep. Like, for example, is Kiz K- King Cosmo your favorite character? That's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the other Who's thing your favorite that, character? The grandma. Oh, I she, really would like to hear what every one of these people had to say about the topic, independent of what they all had to say. Because they kept talking about like Zynga and getting all over the place and. They kept talking about now and not 30. I don't think there was was maybe two things they talked about that actually maybe discussed what gaming would be like 30 years in the future. Yeah, no one asked about like procedural content generation or where the fuck did VR go. These guys, this guy was CEOs and stuff. They don't even know stuff we know. It's like, we know stuff, and, they don't know Except it. the Game Lab guy. He seemed to know the most. He knows the most, but he didn't. He still didn't know. Well, like they were talking about the industry and like who plays games and who doesn't. And I don't think anyone up there realized that the Sega Genesis is so crazily popular in South America. Yeah, I mean, they were like, yeah, I guess, ga- you know, who plays console games elsewhere in the world? I'm like, dude, people are playing games everywhere in the world. They're just not playing. They might be playing PlayStation 3 and Xbox Or like in China, the opposite. They're just playing PC games. They knew that. They knew about China, but they didn't know about South America. They know about China because ching, ching, money in China, all right? Yeah. You notice how the CEO guy, he was all business. He was like, you know, there are more gamers in China than there are, he pe- gets a lot of credit there are for people in the U.S. One guy asked a kind of lame question about if money were no object and there were no constraints of technology or anything, what kind of game would you make? He's like, I wouldn't make a game because well, there'd be no money in it. People all had their answers and he basically, he shut the guy down by saying what Scott just said and then saying, and without constraints, like it's not even really a question. There's no way to answer that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I will. He was de- it was definitely a cool guy because like he was a CEO of a big company, right? And he definitely acted, he was all business, but he didn't he had like a, you know, a normal dude personality. He was like, "Hey, what's going on? What's up?" You know, he was laughing and having a good time and, you know, chilling. He didn't have a lot. It didn't seem like he had the the real strong gaming knowledge even though he's a CEO but of a game But if the publisher. questions had been better, I would have loved to hear his perspective on the economics of gaming 30 years from yeah. now. But I'm at sure the same he would have time, a lot to say about it. I think that you know, while that guy, he's a good guy, you could tell, but you could also tell that that's that kind of CEO is the reason that we have a lot, so much trouble 
just in general with companies these days is that the guys running companies don't actually they're are not actually passionate about the thing the company does, right? This is why Apple can kick everyone's ass despite being jerks, because Steve Jobs fucking knows and cares about computers, and that's why he can go and say, This computer shit, fix this, fix this, fix this. And you know, this take two guy, if they show him Civ five, he's not gonna go up and say, No, the hexes aren't gonna work. Blah, blah. He doesn't know. He just says, oh, Okay, go go nuts. You know, you need, you know, Sid Meier should be the CEO of Take Two. Then you'd have, right, such quality. It would be unbelievable. The one interesting point that was raised was the idea that once video games become like generic, like they are ubiquitous, they're just part of culture. There's going to be a generation that rebels against video games, just like they rebel against everything else at some point. That was the one thing, the one really interesting thing that someone said that was, uh, like imagine you know, a that kid, could be 30 like years imagine, out. you know, right now it's like, Parents will say things like, all right, at least little Johnny is playing video games instead of getting into crack. Maybe video games will get him interested mm -hmm. in history. Imagine 30 years from now, there's a time where parents are saying, well, at least he's only doing X, but hopefully that'll get him interested in video games. We really want him to be playing video yeah, games. See, here's the thing, though, with that is I think that uh, that argument is actually wrong because what they're doing there is, you know, they compare it to rock and roll, right? And the thing is, rock and roll is a genre, but video games are a medium, right? It's not going to be a question of we need to get him into video games. It's going to be like, if only he would play FPSs, right? He's not playing FPSs. He's playing these trash genre of games. You know, kids these days, they might not like rock and roll. They still like music. You know, even the old people who complained about rock and roll like music. Everyone likes movies, but the old people like the old black and white movies, you know, and the new punk kids. I would argue that like, M. Night Shyamalan does not, in fact, like movies and is doing everything in his power to destroy them. I'm just saying in general, right, <laughs> is that it's not going to be an issue of, you know, there's no one's going to rebel against video games. They might just rebel against particular genres of video games in favor of other genres, and we're going to say, that kind of video game you're playing is shit. You should be playing Pac-Man. And they go, fuck Pac-Man. I'm going to play Farmville 10, you know, or... Uh, dude bro three. Right? The other cool point along these lines was that gaming, like the stuff we do that makes us kind of literate at gaming is going to be just a basic component of societal literacy in the future. That, I mean, think about the language we have about discussing game mechanics or games or even non-games, but in the context of games. And uh, the point was made that, you know, reading, and we make this point all the time, so maybe that's why I remember it so much, that Literacy doesn't just mean reading and writing, because if you can read and write and you're not computer literate, you're already at such a disadvantage that it won't be long until you're basically not even considered societally literate. Yeah, this there's, there's all kinds of different literacy, right? And he talked about, which I didn't even think about before, like video game literacy, like you pick up a controller and you, you turn on Mario and you don't know what to do. You're not video game literate. You just you don't know, you know, what buttons to push. You can't just, you know, control the buttons and push them without having to consciously think about them. You're you're lacking a literacy there, you know? It, I look at, you know, a Zelda game and you see an eyeball on the wall. You know you gotta shoot that shit. Some people don't have that natural instinct that they see the eyeball up there and they know that that's for shooting. They don't they're not literate in that kind of thing, you know? Someone sees six stats, strength, dex, int whiz, con, and they have no idea what they mean. They're not literate in the RPG stat kind of game they don't they don't get it they need and you know they need to become you know to learn that shit but one point that eric zimmerman made my last point i want to bring up because i thought it was cool one guy did ask about uh, board games and he's like you guys are talking like video games yeah, are the only did, future yeah, his question was a good question but he asked it in a really bad way oh my way. god yeah i just he wanted just him kept, to shut up he should have just said what about tabletop gaming because i know the zimmerman guy we actually met him once before for like 30 seconds because we went to a board game night at his company yeah he knows what's up and he he expressed this again like yeah board games are great and euro games and he said all the key words that make me know that he knows what's up he knows what's up and he had an interesting answer, but I wish they would have discussed that more. And well, I wish because we're board game guys. Of course, you want to discuss board just, games more. Well, no, more like it, like where that's going to go. And also, they would have had more time if they just shut the guy up after he asked his question. Yes, I mean his question could have just been some. He could have just said, "What about tabletop gaming?" That's all he had to say. But he went on for like two minutes. Blah blah blah. You know, I grew up uh, the, 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 the dice and the. Blah, blah, blah. It's like we don't care about you. Just say, "What about tabletop games?" That's all you gotta say. Then shut up. So, things of the day. 
Um, I, I kind of want to talk about NS2 again, but I'm going to not talk about it until I've played it. Oh, shit. So my thing of the day is a, a little museum, 12 pictures, a slideshow of famous or interesting shivs. Okay, I want to make sure this isn't a duplicate of an extremely multiple-year-old thing of the day where we had a gallery of uh, shivs collected from prison that were showing the ingenuity of the prisoners. See, now that was... All the different shivs they were able to make out of different things. This is actually different because that was, you know, prisoner ingenuity and they had all these non-shiv items as well. This is just shivs, and it's on this kind of design blog talking about looking at, like, the actual design of the shiv. Like, from a design perspective. Well, it needs to be easy to hide... It needs to be cheap to construct. Easy to make. What's cool is a lot it of them. It needs to be would actually. Use... It needs to actually be pointy and dangerous, and maybe even deconstructible, so that it no longer is a shiv. One anymore. guy made a glove that has another glove over it, and if you ba- basically, it's Wolverine claws hidden inside of it. Whoa! There were carpet tacks. One guy took a typewriter and turned the pole down the middle into a shiv. No. One, it looks like a club someone medieval would make, but instead of like nubs like, on the like end, a, like a wooden, like a wooden club with spikes. Yes, but the spikes were basically a board they, with a nail in it. He saved mm. the safety razor blades that they could buy from like the commissary, and he put them in and made this dangerous looking motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, so safety razor blades, but don't they make you like shave with them and give them back? I don't know. Apparently you could just buy them. So people made shivs out of them. I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> I, they, I'd do, assume they not. the prison barber shave you if you want to shave? I don't know. See, the thing is, if I was in prison, I would grow a beard. You know why? Hide my shiv in there. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> so I thought this was cool. And it you know, wasn't just a college humor video for once. Mine is a, is a YouTube video, even though it was posted on Boing Boing. And the thing is, I do quite a few things of the day from Boing Boing, and it seems like no one actually reads Boing Boing. I don't get it. Anyway, or at least no one says anything that, hey, I saw your, your thing of the day on Boing Boing. Why do you keep picking stuff from there? Uh, you know, so- no one says anything about my college humor picking except you. Well, because your college, college humor. your college humor picking is much more prevalent than my Boing Boing picking. Yeah, but no one points it out. No one's like, Rim, you just steal from college humor. I guess no one reads any of the internet. That's another <laughs> that, possibility. That's be it. Um, except that they, I guess they check out Geek Night's things of the day. So, uh, what this is is Raytheon. Apparently, uh, solid state lasers. Right, there's multiple kinds of lasers. Solid state is a good kind, uh, and solid state lasers weren't really powerful enough for any sort of military use. But now they are. Raytheon has a 50 kilowatt. That's a lot. Solid state laser, and um, they sent up an unmanned flying drone. And they sh- shot their laser at it. Pew, pew, pew. And it totally worked. And it exploded and crashed. And here's a video of it. It's, it's black and white because it's infrared. That way you can see what's going on. And it was probably done at night, you know, because they like to keep shit secret. And they and probably also in the middle of nowhere where uh, the plane could crash into the ground without killing anybody. So, uh, and, you know, it's the cool thing about this is it's basically you have infinite ammo as long as you have electricity, right? Well, the electron, I mean, it, it's still ammo. You've just got a really good supply of it. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not truly unlimited ammo. It's effectively unlimited ammo. So check out this video. We're going to have uh, lasers soon. And, you know, that's, that's telling because I've been, I just finished watching Space Battleship Yamato, the second television series in which ah, there were space lasers. You're getting ahead of me on long, old anime. I'm almost out of Leiji Matsumoto. I mean, what else am I going to watch? I've watched Harlock, the 70s show. Yeah. I watched Galaxy Express. I watched almost all the Yamato. I've got to watch three three or four Yamato movies. You realize the and next step is Legend of the Galactic Heroes. No. That's that, the next step. No, You're going to watch it. It's going to happen. Not, is it by Leiji Matsumoto? It is going to happen. No. You're going to watch it. <laughs> Maybe when I'm an old man and retired and I have nothing better to do. So briefly, the meta the moment. The book club, the current book club, is still the Lies of Lock Lamer, which we both read and we'll have a show up for it Soonish. It's I written by Scott Lynch. I haven't picked the next book yet. It's Lupin the Third in a fantasy world. That's it. Oh, that's a good call. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's got some other stuff going on though. Almost no. Oh, it's got a precursor civilization built in. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's. But Lu- Lupin's. Some of the Lupins have that. Like, remember the Lupin was the one with the secret town. Well, oh uh, uh, yeah. Also, Legend of the Babylon Gold. That one doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much more important, NS2, the Alpha, is uh, coming out on July 26th. How is that meta? <laughs> I don't know. Because I'm going to disappear for about a week. Did we already discuss this? Yes. Okay. That was the joke. Uh, other meta things. We are, we've announced it already, but we're not going to be attending Otakon because as of today, they still don't have a schedule for us panelists, so we bailed. Yep. 
We'll be at the Penny Arcade Expo, Penny PAX Prime. Labor Day weekend in Seattle. Seattle. We'll be doing egregiously unrealized potential. We will also be doing game mechanics and mechanism design. You hardcore fuckers want some hardcore panels? We got oh, it. Dude, we'll see if you the, like it. I was. Th- I just. I came up with that whole mechanism game design panel. I just came up with the whole thing. Really? Yeah, I did. I'm gonna do it. I figured. Okay, it out. you you handle that one. I started the uh, the act raiser panel. So yeah, I pretty much like it came to me in a in a, it wasn't. I'm not gonna give it the status of vision. It was a. Ha- it was maybe a viz. See, I had the vision <laughs> for the egregiously unrealized potential, and and I'm gonna spoil that panel a little bit for all of you. There's this anime called Summer Wars. I'm going to show a clip from that at the panel, like halfway through. And then I'm going to be like, everyone, wasn't that awesome? And I'm going to step back and say, all right. Now, imagine that mixed with the words I'm about to say. Pokemon. Pokemon MMO. Why doesn't it exist? Oh, my God. Yeah, we got this shit down. We're doing (laughs) at least one, maybe two other events at PAX Prime that we can't talk about yet. Yep. Uh (laughs) Here's some events that I may or may not be attending in New York City for New York City people. You ready for this? Uh, on 7 o'clock p.m. on August 2nd, there is a hack and tell. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll post a link to it. But basically, the idea is it's going to be sort of a monthly thing, maybe, where tech people show up and some people just say, hey, this is what I'm working on lately. Cool. And, you know, you just chill. Also, uh, at t- noon, from noon to 5 p.m. on August uh, 7th, Saturday, there is going to be a Mozilla drum beat, which is going to be all about open web, open culture. You know, some of the, uh, our friend John Britton is going to be there. All right. We got to yeah. do another open everything. Yeah, it's, it's just sort of an open everything-ish kind of thing. It's a Mozilla drum beat, so we'll probably hit that up. See what's going down. That's the same weekend as Gen Con, by the way. We're not going to Gen Con. Nope. But Gen Con is August 5th through 8th. But we are going the weekend of October 8th, 9th, and 10th. We, there, there is a Nerd NYC board game night on the 8th. There is also the beginning of 10, 10, 10, which begins on the 8th. That whole weekend is Burning Wheel shenanigans in Astoria. It's also the New York Comic Con and the New York Anime Festival. Oh, snap. We're going to be at... Pretty much all of those. Yeah. The New York Anime Con, the Comic Con and, and the Anime Festival are in the same building at the same time. But uh, buying one ticket to one show will actually give you admission to both shows. You don't buy, don't be stupid and buy two tickets. Right. And uh, the thing is, they are going to be separate shows, though. They're going to have their separate programming schedules and they're going to have separate exhibit. Hall yeah, we're going to do like our gaming panels in the Comic Con side and our anime panels in the anime are side. We, are we confirmed on the Comic Con side? Uh, yeah. All right, cool. They're the same event. We're just it's a matter of, you know, how many of our panels we're actually doing. We're probably going to do all our previous PAX panels and all our, like, A-list anime panels. That many? Yeah. Oh, man. We're going to rock it. There's no reason not to. We live right here, and this is, like, the this might end up being the biggest con we go to outside of what PAX East is, is going to become. It is going to be become. quite large population-wise. I'm sort of afraid. But you know what? Every time we go to a convention in the Javits, right, the convention, you know, because the Javits sort of has these separate areas, the downstairs, the upstairs, right? And it seems like a large portion of the Javits is always sort of empty-ish. Like, everyone is crammed into one part, and the other part is, like, desolate. It's kind of like, remember way back in the day, like, we went to one of the last Otakons. They didn't have the entire BCC. Imagine how weird it would be to see Otakon going on, and there's, like, a room where there's nothing. So it's going to be crazy, because with this double con, they're going to use pretty much the whole Javits, the whole thing, and it is gonna. There's gonna be people crowding every area of the whole place. It's gonna be insane. And the Javits sucks. Yeah, the Javits <laughs> sucks. Uh, sadly, that was I my. Don't, that was my. Uh, you know, Carthage. <laughs> I don't know if the BCEC sucks, but PAX East is going to fill it eventually. Yeah, that was my Carthage uh, Delinda mess. Carthago Delinda mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've still got my Malum and, and the, badges. And the Javit and... sucks. <laughs> yeah, Malum badges ass. <laughs> okay. Um, I think let, that's let, about it. Let's move on to the, the main bit, I guess. Right? So we're going to talk about two oh, no, games. We did, we did things today. We did yeah, that yeah, moment, did, right? What, what are you doing here? I'm making sure that's we didn't I'm mess the, up the show. That's why I'm the producer. Uh-huh. Yeah? Producing farts. Uh, <laughs> well, that's, ir- that's irrelevant. <laughs> You're also producing poops. <laughs> Uh, I am producing poop, in fact, yes. I'm, yes. I'm, ma- I'm manufacturing that's, that's, it. That is the reason that you have the title of producer. For the, later and the, delivery. And the sole reason you have the title of producer. I guess you're the CTO at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, the chief I'm the, technical I'm the, I'm officer. The, I'm the CYMO. Ah, uh, like a... <laughs> anyway. So, roll through the ages. 
or Chicago Express? Well, let's do uh, Chicago Express first. So we're hanging at the board game night, and we played Roll Through the Ages. But then, after we played Roll Through the Ages, which we'll talk about second. Oh, I'm mixing it up. It's oh, all crap. fucked out now. Um, the, the guy who was playing with us, he had some games. And one of the games he had with him was... It was basically Railroad Tycoon on a different map. And yep. I was like, all right, I'm not, I don't, I'd not. like to play something I haven't played before. Well, the thing is, we actually kind of wanted to play that game until we realized it wouldn't fit on the table. Yeah. So then we're like, what's this other game? Once he started explaining the mechanics of Chicago Express, it is not the best game in the world. It has got some flaws that we'll talk about. But it has got some novel fucking mechanics that I want to steal for another game. And if they're not novel, I haven't seen them before. And I've seen a lot of fucking games. Now, some games have done this, but so here's the, it's a train game. It's not a crayon train game. No, it's a, it's a wooden train train game. But the deal is, you don't own a railroad. No. You don't own shit. You've got money, and your goal is to have the most money at the end. Nothing, Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. It's just money. And the thing is... That always gets away from me in those kind of games is like you forget the victory condition when it's, you know, and like you'll have some thing, some resource and you'll pump it up or you'll put a bunch of money into it to pump it up. And all you did was dump a bunch of money away. You pump something up, but you needed that money to win and now you spent it and now you're going to lose because that thing you pumped up isn't actually going to get you more money than you spent to pump it. And that was stupid. I also like games where they have the mechanic of basically spending your victory points to get more. Mm. But the, the deal is, so you start, everyone starts with money, and there's railroads on the board, and each one has a different number of shares it can sell, and it has its own bank. The only thing you can do with money is bid on and buy shares of stock in railway companies. So, for example, the Yellow Railroad starts in a specific spot, and it has six shares. That's it. And the green, uh, what was it? The green one had three. No, the red one has three. three shares. Yellow one had a bunch. They're all different. Yeah. And, and each one has a different number of railroad bits they can put down, like track. Mm -hmm. So a railroad can only build track by spending its own money. So if I buy a share of red for 10 bucks, that means that red now has 10 bucks. I don't have 10 bucks. Red has 10 bucks. And anyone who has a share, at least one share of red, can use that 10 bucks to buy trains and make red travel someplace. Now think of this, only three shares of red. If all three shares, like say I'm clever and I waste everyone else's money and then I bid and buy all three shares of red so no one else can get in for like nothing. For a, I, Let's say everyone lets me buy red for cheap and I get all three shares of red for like a dollar. All right, there's a dollar in the bank. There's almost no way to get more money into that railroad. That railroad's fucked. And these shares yeah, are worth nothing to now me. Now red, I have all three shares of red. It doesn't have any more shares to sell. Red only has three dollars. $3 buys red, exactly one train, and it needs like a whole bunch of trains to be able to get across the board to Chicago where you win, you, you know, you get a bunch of points to win. So, so you've got, you can't just get the shares for cheap. You want to get the shares for cheap, but getting the shares for cheap hurts the railroad that you just got into. So you but want then again, if you overpay, the railroad will have way more money than it needs and you will have less victory points because you wait, you just pump them into a railroad or you overpaid, and they're not helping you win. You overpaid, someone else buys in for cheap, but then they basically get half the, of your money to build up the railroad and you share the yeah, points. I buy a share of red for 20 bucks. Rim buys a share of red for $1. Now Rim is basically using my $20 to buy trains uh, on the Red Railroad, and they get him just as many points as they get me. It's just I'm basically making 19 points less because I spent 19 points more to get my share, and I now have equal standing. So Rim is now ahead by a so lot. So to build tracks from a railroad, you have to own shares in it, at least one. So if three people own shares in one color, any of those three people on their turn can spend their action to build tracks. So say I own a share in a railroad that... The, the current winner also owns shares in. And I own shares in another railroad where the current winner does not have any shares. I might sabotage the one that I share with the winner by just wasting its money and sending tracks off through the mountains into nowhere. Yeah, let me, let me return to the previous example, right? Except we're going to crook it a little so. I buy a share of red for 20. I buy another share of red for 20. Now, red has 40 bucks. That's a lot. And I've got two out of the three shares in the whole game. I am the king of red. That is badass. That is probably going to make me win. But Rim comes in, and for $1, he buys the final share of red. I get a third of the I points. I could not stop him from doing this. Now, not only is he going to get all these points and a bunch of all the money and income from the Red Railroad, 
But he can just sabotage the Red Railroad. He can spend my $40 and his $1 that were pumped into red and build trains just going off into the middle of nowhere that suck and don't really do anything, thus sabotaging my $40 investment and uh, taking me out on the cheap. So this meta mechanic of buying stock and then using the, and, and the, the money, it's really fun. Like, I love this mechanic. The other cool thing is, so you've got players, you've got three little sliders. One is like, well, like spinny things, gauges. One is improve something, one is start an auction, and one is lay track. So on your turn, you pick one of those three actions and move the slider up. Yep, you. I, see. The slider starts on green, has a couple of spaces, and goes to red. If you move it to red, no one else can do that action for the rest of the turn. So after like three or four auctions, no more auctions this turn. The turn does not end until two of the three sliders have gotten to red. So if I do all the auctions, then we uh, everyone needs to either build tracks or build little development houses, which is boost your points. That's all they do. Um, until one of them is full up, and then we can go to the next turn. So it, it basically, it's a similar idea to the Rondel. Oh, the Rondel yeah. from, uh, what game was that? I forget that? the name of that game. Oh, shit. But yeah, the Rondel is basically a sa the same kind of mechanic to regulate the actions the players take. Antiki? Yeah, that's the game. Let me, let me see if it's... Antike. But these, these two mechanics together are just really awesome. And the game is really fun. And I imagine there's, like, if you have skilled players playing the game, it's a lot like Age of Steam in that you've got a lot of very high-powered, high-level play... Good players will kind of faint and, and duck each other in bidding, and, and there's a lot going on. But the game is not balanced terribly well. And unlike Age of Steam, which will kick a player out of the game, you can be mathematically eliminated from winning pretty easily, and you're stuck playing this game, and you, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. I was in that situation, actually, the first time we played. Well, I was the only time was, we played. Yes, I was mathematically eliminated from victory. There was no way for me to exit the game, and there was no way for me to alter the course of the game, except possibly to kingmake. It was pretty much a Nash equilibrium situation, right? Because the guy who knew how to play, who owned the game, he had this green railroad to himself early on, and he sort of you know remembered that money was the way to win. We pretty much couldn't catch up to him. And there was a situation where he couldn't end the game because... T buying a share, uh, any of the remaining shares on the board would have been a stupid move because the minimum cost of any of the shares on the board was greater than the amount of money you would have gotten from owning the share. Thus, buying any share on the board would only hurt to, would only cause you to lose money. That's so all the game can easily fall into the situation. But the game would not end because to make the game end, you would have had to buy a share. Where a player has to do an action that will guaranteed lose them the game to end the game. But if they don't do that, the player who's winning just continues to pull further ahead and they lose anyway. So you, someone, it, has a, it has a game's over, but it's not over. So problem. someone has to suicide to end the fucking game. Or you can just wait till it ends from running out of houses or trains or whatever, which yeah. takes forever. So, and there's still no way that you can catch up. So I don't know if I would necessarily recommend buying the game. But the mechanics are, you're like, you've got to play the game at least yeah. once and as check out a, these mechanics. As a whole, the game has some flaws. But that mechanic of the putting money into the railroads and getting the shares is awesome. And if you could take that mechanic elsewhere, it'd be great. Uh, okay, so yeah, Antique is the, is the game that does have the rondel. But apparently, right, get this, there's actually a rondel series. It consists Whoa. of there's Antique, Hamburgum, Imperial, Imperial 2030, Hamburgum. and a game called Navigador, and they all have the Rondel, as you can see here. And actually, the Imperial game is ranked number 30 on Board Game Geek, if I am not mistaken. Let me just confirm this. But yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Watch, wow. out, watch out for the Rondel. So it's a game to play. Uh, you, it'd be fun to buy. If you have money to, you know, spend on it, basically. But I'm not going to buy it because I'd like to play it maybe one more time with, like, all skilled players, and that's it. Mm. Yeah, Imperial is a game from 2006. It's actually a new game in the Rondel series, and it's ranked number 30. So the other game we played that Scott bought, and I think it was a good purchase, Yahtzee Through the Ages, the Bronze <laughs> Age. So basically, I was looking at the Spiel des Jahres winning game, uh, nominated games. The winner was Dish It, right? Or Dix It, or whatever you pronounce it. Dish It, what, I don't care. That's the game of the bunnies and the storytelling. But the, uh, the nominated, one of the nominated games was Roll Through the Ages. And at first, I was confused, because I already had Through the Ages. And I thought Roll Through the Ages was an expansion. It's not. 
It's its completely own game, has nothing to do with Through the Ages, except for they named it that to try to sell it, the same way that Carcassonne Cities was trying to get sell copies with the name Carcassonne, right? Same. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, buy Starfarers of Catan. It's, it is similar to Settlers of Catan mechanically, but it really is its own game, and we're just trying to use the Catan name to sell it to you. Uh, that's that's basically what goes on with Roll Through the Ages. Roll Through the Ages is a completely standalone game, has, has nothing to do with Through the Ages, but they call it Through the Ages to try to sell it to you. So it is Yahtzee, but it has interesting mechanics of like getting goods, spending the goods. Yeah, basically Yahtzee is a random game, and what the only thing is that when you roll the dice in Yahtzee, there's sometimes there's a slight risk calculation, like should I go for Yahtzee or should I go for Large Straight, you know? And sometimes uh, in Yahtzee, you could score something two different ways, and to say, sometimes, you know, not 100% perfect uh, answer to which area you should score it under because you don't know what you're going to roll in In the which future. case, it's arbitrary, and that's why the game breaks down. Yes, it's basically a game of just playing the odds and knowing where to score different rolls, and then luck. So Roll Through the Ages is almost the same game as Yazi. You roll, you pick up the dice you don't like, you roll them again, you pick up the dice you don't like, you roll them again, and then you score whatever's remaining. The difference is that you start with only three dice... And instead of just scoring in different rows, you actually use the dice as sort of resources to build a, quote, civilization, right? You can use your resources to get food. You can use it to get more dice, which are cities. You can use it to get developments, which give you, you know, special bonus powers. Or you can use it to build monuments, and monuments give you victory points. Uh, And so do developments and other things. So what happens is you're trying to roll different dice to get you know, it's like, I need workers so that I can build this monument. I need food so I can feed my cities, because every turn you lose food. For, you have to pay one food for every dice that you roll. And uh, if you don't have enough food, you lose points. And if you roll, you know, you can roll skulls, which give you lots of goods, which turn into money to buy developments. But too many skulls cause disasters, which also make you lose victory points. So... You know, you're, you're doing this careful balancing act of rolling the dice, trying to get a lot of points... Uh, but you're also trying not to lose a lot of points at the same time. And it's not just an obvious way to score. You know, it's, it actually takes a lot of figuring out. And you're not just trying to do something like roll five exactly the same. You're trying to, you know, get specific things in a good mix here and there. Now, the game is not like it's fun, but it's definitely not a perfect game. At least not the default rules. You know, the basic rules, it's pretty much just a solitaire. And you just have to keep track of like who's built what and plan around yeah. it. Like, he's building a great pyramid. Maybe I shouldn't start it. The, the default game uh, definitely is very solitary. You're just really racing against the other people to see who, you know, when the game, en- you know, I guess the gaming ending depends on all the players, but it's basically who can get the most points before the game ends. However, there are a couple of aspects of the game that are interactive, right? If I build a monument, let's say I build a pyramid, that gives me 12 points. Now, anyone else who builds the pyramid after me only gets six points. So being the first to build a monument is good. Also, there is an optional rule where you can trade goods with each other. I'm not sure how useful that actually is. And the disasters, if I there are certain disasters. Like if you roll three skulls, you can actually hurt everybody else with pestilence, but not yourself. Yep, and the improvements you can build with your goods along the way can do stuff like, I get more workers, I'm not affected by pestilence, things like that. Yeah, there is, uh, if you go to their website, right, they have this optional, uh, like advanced through the ages rule set. It's like called something else. It's called like, uh, what is it? Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 um, Regardless, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, but they have an expansion. The expansion consists of a, uh, a different score sheet that has more developments on it that are more interactive with the other players. That The game could definitely use some interaction. Now, I know there's the variant that lets you trade goods, and there's, like, trading. I, I already talked about that, but, yeah, okay, so that, yeah, the... But, uh, well, I guess that... I worry that this game cannot be made very interactive without running into the kind of Agricola endgame of it's fiddly and not fun to do that sort of interaction. Yeah. Or running into the Settler's endgame of I'll never trade with anyone because if I trade with someone, it'll either help them win or they're stupid and they'll help me win. 
Okay, so yeah, the, the the one that we the if you buy the box, it's it's roll through the ages, the Bronze Age. But the ex, the advanced one is roll through the ages, the late Bronze Age. It's a print, <laughs> the late Bronze Age. It's the it's a print and play expansion, according to Board Game Geek. Uh, it has a, a set of additional rules and a new score sheet that you just download, which is and it has n- four new developments. Uh, and it changes the cost and reward of five other developments. And trading between players is now just a rule, you know. Uh, and there's also a shipping development that allows you some resource conversion, I guess. Uh, the thing is, right, that um, you buy... Let's say you decide that late Bronze Age is better than Bronze Age. You like the more interactive game with the fixed rules better than the original game. So you bought this game, and most of what's in the box is this big score pad full of score sheets. It's a big pad. And now you're just going to use this score sheet that you print online. You're not going to use the score sheet that came with the game and you have this big pad of useless score sheets you're never going to use. Awesome. Awesome. Not awesome. If they should have just made it errata and they should have just started printing the new editions of the game with the newer, different score sheet and, you know, pretended and maybe sent out a free pad of new score sheets to everyone who bought the original. Because you don't need anything else but the different score sheet and maybe a rule explanation for to do late Bronze Age. So. I think it's worth owning because it's it's a good social game to like whip out at a con. It's can, quick. Yeah, it's, it's easy. Por- it's portable. Everyone you know knows how to play it because it's Yahtzee, right? People like Civilization. You can teach it quickly. It's not just obvious how to win. There's actually something going on there. Like it kind of serves the same gaming purpose that Ra does, but it's a better game than Ra. I think what it actually helps replace are those games like Flux and all those ones that you, uh, all those games that people like to whip out real quick. It's like you can just whip out Roll Through the Ages instead, and it'll be it's much better, you know. Or Dominion, depending. Well, Dominion's much bigger. This yeah. has the smallness and the portability and the quickness. Yeah, if you, especially if you don't bring Dominion, the score sheets, Dominion, you can basically bring this game just in a dice bag. Dominion has big setup time, and it takes a while to... If people don't know, they have to learn it and to read the cards, and it takes a while to play. But uh, this, you just whip it out. You can teach it to someone right away and go. Now, neither one of these games is a masterpiece by any stretch. I mean, Puerto Rico is still the number one on Board Game Geek. And That's like right. Agricola and TE and Kalis and El Grande and all the games we love, Dominion, are in the top 10. So, also, Twilight Struggle is still number three. <laughs> I don't know what people see in that game. Do you still have it? Yeah, I still have it. You want to play it? I kind of do, but every time we try to play it halfway through, I say, fuck this. And so it, if, if only it was digitized. Oh, my I God. think there is a digital version somewhere. We should go. I should look into that. Yeah, because then it might make it easier for us to uh, to play the game because we wouldn't worry about messing up rules. And we also uh, would not have trouble with the extended setup time and such and so such. So I guess if you don't own or haven't played Puerto Rico, Agricola, Power Grid, Dominion, Kalis El Grande, Tigris and Euphrates... Goa, Shogun. We don't even have Goa. I know. I would buy and play all of those before I would buy Roll Through the Ages. And I, or Chicago Express. I wouldn't buy Chicago Express, but I'd play it again. Yeah. yeah I would definitely, I want to play it one more time, just now concentrating. Yeah, now knowing. If I did, because I know that if I play it again, I'm going to concentrate on money is the key. I like money how the Wabash the uh, Railroad comes out, like right at the end. Oh, yeah. It's like this black trains. And as soon as someone actually gets to Chicago, the black train appears. There's also this whole mechanic of like the more money. A company is making the more the minimum bid is on the shares. So if you you can pump the value of a train company up to prevent other people from bidding on shares. Mm. Very interesting. Yep. It's just it. I don't know. I feel like the math could be tweaked to make it a better, like a perfect game, or at least a great game. But it falls short because the math isn't great. I think they just need to change the end game condition a little bit so that the game actually ends. Well, I feel like uh, if I have to update Losing Should Be Fun for whenever we run it again, because I have the the train game examples of how Age of Steam and Railroad Tycoon handle this in two different ways. I want to add Chicago Express in to point out this game doesn't handle it. Mm, Three train games for the same example. I like that. Yeah. But yeah, the uh, Roll to the Ages, definitely a big improvement on Yahtzee. Throw your Yahtzee away. And uh, Chicago Express, interesting bidding mechanic on the shares of the railroad. Yeah, any game designers out there, steal from the Forgotten Masters. And this game isn't even that old or forgotten, but game mechanics aren't copyrightable. There, yeah, so just go for it. This 
This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>